Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Jeff Rock, and welcome to another D. Hilton Associates webinar. Today, we're going to be discussing uh, the all-important thing about planning for budgets and some of the strategies that we're going to plan for looking at the 2023 with all the things that are going on. So compensation budget planning is what we're going to be talking about. We've got a lot to go through. We're probably going to go a little bit over time on this one because there's going to be a lot of stuff and a lot of detail we want to dig into. Uh, but first, I want to go through a couple of administrative items while people are still settling in for the presentation. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, so if you miss anything, the webinars are always posted on our website at dhilton.com. You can find all the previous webinars there as well. So if you miss something in this, please feel free to log on to that. Give us a couple days. It'll be uh, probably about two or three business days. We'll get that loaded on there. You'll receive a follow-up email with the slide deck is included. So you'll have a link in there to be able to download the slide deck, get the information that we're talking about today. And you'll also receive a survey. Give us a, a, an idea of how we did on these. You know, We take a lot of the concepts and ideas and topics that we move forward from those surveys. We want to understand what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what you would like to see more of. Uh, positive feedback. We always love some good feedback, even if it's critical feedback. I'm okay with that as well. Okay, if you have any questions through this whole process, please feel free to use the Q&A section. The Q&A section will come directly to us here in the studio, and the uh, chat box will come initially directly to us, but you can actually select it to go to all participants as well if you'd like to ask a question to the participants. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce John Andrews. How are you, John? Doing good. Hey, Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Good. Yeah, I just want to reiterate, we have a lot of information today, so we're not going to rush. Um, remember, we'll, we'll uh, kind of clip this to make it tighter if you want to ha get this off to, to some of your colleagues, but uh, stay with us. I think it's going to be some good information. Okay. Not that we do anything other than great information, John, right? That, that's what we do. Yeah, I guess I shouldn't have said it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to interview new hosts. <laughs> way, way, to, way to build me up. There we go. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> so when we look at the agenda today, four, four key things. We're going to look at the idea of the concept of the evolution of what a salary range does or doesn't do for us as we do workforce planning. The idea that when we you know, trying to, to get out of the grips of egalitarianism, mm -hmm. um, the idea that we do need to take a, a, a look at special folks in a, in a different way today. Um, what market pricing means in today's market, you know, after, after the, we've all agreed that inflation is not transitory. And finally, give you a peek at what we're going to see for 23. And there's, you know, there's, there's some decent things and there's some ugly things, but you want to go through it and we want to start uh, getting everybody ready for those meetings that they're going to have. So I always like to start with a low bar. So let's start with Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, like we say, there's a quota for you uh, unintentionally insulting someone. Oh, so I didn't mean, it, didn't mean it that way. I just think go. it's a good benchmarking <laughs> organization. So this is how they're firing people with this eloquent statement. The idea that we're, we're doing displacements and that we're doing it in a transparent and thoughtful manner. Well, you can't do displacements transparently or, <laughs> or thoughtfully. <laughs> you have to do that in a back alley someplace and then say, not you, not you, not you. You're out of here. You're out of here. But the, the idea was interesting as we're doing this research. This is a great website. It's, it's just showing you, you know, the momentum of how the mortgage business is ma making more people available to the credit union industry. So, you know, when we start here, we did it last time. Look at what just happened in May. And June's gonna be, is already you know halfway through, and we're seeing it as well. But look, look at these numbers. All these fintechs and mortgage related companies of what they're having to do to cut f cut cut workforces. And the idea here is, um, you know, as they have to become a legitimate business after they've got the buzz on Wall Street, they've got their funding, and now they have to return to their stockholders. And um, it's uh, it's it's a pretty significant list here. And then we go to the second page and we start to look at the mortgage folks. And what we're thinking is no matter where you're in the country, especially on the West Coast, there should be some decent talent. So one of our themes has always been hunters, not gatherers. I would start looking at some of these companies through LinkedIn and see if you can't do a little trolling and see if, uh, if you've got openings that there might be some folks that are out there. Every recruiter just parked up there for a moment. Yeah, hunters, not gatherers. Is that one of our themes? Absolutely. Always. So we've, we've talked about this again last time, but I wanted to reemphasize if people weren't w with us, what inflation is actually doing in, in, in the real world. So, you know, if, if you got if you got to raise or switch jobs and you got to um, 
you know, the, the, your salary grew four and a half percent at twenty twenty dollars. You made forty one thousand six hundred. Uh, you know, you wanted to buy that new car. It was forty one forty one thousand when it started, but after you got your raise, and you say, "Awesome, it's time to go look at that nice truck." And now that truck costs forty seven thousand dollars. So the idea is, we know this is real. We know that em- employees are getting impacted this, and so we're having to be really proactive of how we explain our next our next budget and what we're trying to do for our folks. So we're going to start with salary ranges, and you know this is an art, not a science. So in a traditional Jeff, when we do we do a study, which is it, which is really traditional, is. It's always in a lag situation, right? Because mm-hmm. what do you do first? We're going to be looking at the market. We're going to be understanding exactly what the cost of labor is going to be as okay. well. Okay, and we predict the date, right? Yeah. So January 1st, 2023. Implementation, yeah. And then you build all your salaries that ranges on that that number, right? And then what happens January 2nd? You're already behind. You're behind. You're, mm-hmm. you, you lag. So that's why we call it a lag. <laughs> so this idea of lead lag means, well, let's try to predict where you're going to be in July 1st. So half the year, you've got this premium building and, and this equity building, and then the second half, then the market passes you up. And then finally, there's lead. So not only predicting what January 1st, 23 looks like, but what does January 1st, 24 look like? Is it more expensive? Just a bit. It, it you know, all the things we're going to talk about really have to be pragmatic, right? So it has to be, you know, can we afford it? Does it make sense for us? And what are the techniques to use the money in the best um you know, the, you know the best best return, you know, for the members. But why, why, you know, I don't, you know, why don't we ask that question? Can we look at a strategy other than lag? So the first thing we do is, you know, we've got to look at re- reviewing our structures annually. So in the past, sometimes we didn't want to do that because we didn't want to look at the ugly information to say, oh, we're gonna, <laughs> yeah, I guess we're gonna have to do something here with it. Yes, you can see the CFO's blood pressure going up when you yeah. start talking about yeah. this. Yeah. I'm, CFOs just get off the phone right now. Yeah, <laughs> this is not going to be a great call. Not, not, <laughs> not, 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 not good for you. But, but, but this idea is that, well, you know, our salary range says this is the offer I should make, or this salary range says this person is within the market, but I'm going to ask the second question is, well, when was that done? Mm-hmm. And when inflation was below three, when it was in the twos, we could do every other year. You know, I've had some clients say, do, should we move to an annual schedule? I said, well, if we're in the sixes and sevens on inflation, and you're doing lag, you're going to have a tough time with some of your key jobs. It's yeah. just as simple as that. The market is running away as much as possible. And one of the biggest things here is that the the concept of the midpoint of your range, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, that should be really in alignment with the market value for those roles. That's our anchor. Yeah, that's the goal. And my all, and Our I target. I don't know what, if you do this, but my always definition of, of a salary range midpoint is total skill acquisition. Mm-hmm. It, no matter how long somebody's been there, or where they came from, internal, external, if they can do everything on that job descriptions, they, they, they they're kind of understand the procedures that are in place and their responsibilities, that's a person that should get paid at midpoint. Yeah. I need to switch to yours. Mine is longer. I say somebody that's fully proficient, fully capable, and fully coming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, meeting I'm, all of the expectations on the job description, too. That's a big key there. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's totally. So, uh, you know, I, I think I'll defer to your your de- definition. I like yours. We'll, we'll trade. Okay, you get mine, I get yours. We'll go with that. Total skill acquisition. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's midpoint. Mm-hmm. So again, in the past where we've had these systems that say, um, well, they just, you know, we can't, the person's worked five years for Wells Fargo. They're an awesome branch manager. They've, they've got a ton of sales and service competencies, but we can't bring them in at midpoint because we have another branch manager that's been here five years that's not there. Yeah. Well, that's great that you're looking at internal equity, and it's bad that person's not coming. Yeah. So the idea is that we're, we're always looking about how we use that midpoint as an anchor. Yeah. And in, in our slide here, we're just saying, it, it, you know, and again, mis, uh, salary ranges are m- misleading because if I say the minimum is $20 for a job and the, the six candidates you – um, interview say they need 21. Guess what the market is? 21. Your new minimum is 21. Yeah. Well, I can't do that because I have six, you know, MSRs that are making $20 and 50 cents. It's always a moving target. So that's why we say, why do we always look at lag as the, where we want to anchor our salary ranges when we know the next day it might not be what we're doing. Yeah. So doesn't, this doesn't cost you a penny more. It just means it's more in re- real. It's, it's more aligned with your reality. 
you know, the salary range is sometimes um, this guide, but it's not necessarily, you know, the gospel, as, as I would say it. And that's the kind of thing. This is a guide. It is a target. Salary ranges are a fair line in the sand in which we kind of draw to say, here's the value for these particular role, the skill set, and where we're actually going to start placing. And it helps balance the internal equity. If it's holding you back from certain situations, we've got to address that. We've got to look at what's going on there. Yeah, so let me let me walk everybody through kind of the D. Hilton strategy. It's, it's really classic. So we go to the market for a specific job, and it doesn't matter what the job is, and we come back and say the midpoint for all that market pricing work is 56205 You see the top bar in the blue there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, the 25th percentile of that data is 49907 That is not where we start, start a minimum of a salary range. What I'm looking for, and then you see the 75th is 63927 So in some jobs, when those, when those standard deviations around the market price, the 50th percentile, are real tight, I have real good confidence that everybody in the market is getting in that. Yep. When it's wide, I've said I might have a couple companies out there that are really aggressively pricing it. Or uh, we've got some folks that, you know, kind of a bipolar distribution that we might not even have a good job match, right? That some people were, if we did it by title, it's kind of a red flag. Well, they're, they're, well, they're all <laughs> over the place. So our goal is to match the market. Now, you have this happen every day where, you know, you say the market's 56000 but the three candidates I want want 62000 And your answer is what? Yeah, they're out there. That, yeah. that data is in that, and it does not a market make, but yeah. We, you, we found 62. You but, saw but, it. But when we do the statistics and we look at the whole market, 56 is, is the 50th percentile of that market. Mm-hmm. So the tough thing for you is now where I'm going to make that offer. If you, yeah. if you fall in love with the candidate and they have all that expertise, all the competency, total skill acquisition, if you will, um, <laughs> what are you going to do? And this is that strategic business decision that you hear John and I talk about quite often is that the numbers are just that. It's data. Actually turning that data into information yeah. and viable, usable uh, information to be able to make strategic business decisions from, that's where it comes down. Saying that, well, we can't hire this person because they're above our midpoint. Well, that's kind of a, a policy yeah. that's holding you back. We have to discuss this. Yeah. And – as we've gone, the quality of the data. If you do this exercise and you're using Department of Labor that's two years old, or you're using dated sources, that 56, 205 might not even be the right number. And that's why you're getting the people making 60,000 that want to come mm-hmm. work for you because your data might be old. Now, let's transition. So how do we make this into some type of actionable tool that we can use for our organization? So in this case, if we knew the marketplace was 56.2, let's turn that into a salary range with a 30% spread and look at 56.200 uh, as the midpoint just around it. And so our minimum would become 48.9. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is a 30% spread. So you look at, you know, take 48.9, add 1.3, the 30% spread, and you get a max of 63.5. So you following me? Gotcha. That's the range. But total skill acquisition is what? 56.200. If you've got a training or apprentice, where would you put them? Yeah, a little bit less than that. You're yeah. closer to that 48.900. Yeah. Now, this is just a, a cardinal sin. You've got somebody at 63.5, and their merit increase is going to come up, so they're not getting a raise, or you're going to redline them. So you come back and say, well, can we make the spread 40%, <laughs> right? So we move that max, let's just call another three or 4,000. So now the max is uh, 66,000. What happened to your minimum? Your, well, if you kept the balanced offset, your minimum just got lower. Yeah, so you're saying your starting wage is now 46. Mm-hmm. And then if you're a credit union that really focuses on hires at, at the minimum or in that bottom quartile, why can't you find anybody? Because now you're below the 25th percentile, even further below the 25th percentile. That's not going to be able to pull anybody. So you took care of one person, that maxed out really good person. And then at the detriment of maybe hurting the whole structure for any new hires coming up for the year. So this this is not good or bad. This is just the consequences of looking at this and trying to be real consistent while making sure we're taking care of our our really good employees. So when you do market pricing, one, make sure it's current. Mm -hmm. Get as much you can from your local market. Make sure that you've got a good career progression through a range, but be willing to make an art out of this and make really good decisions to get the best people in. 
And and this is also based off the pay philosophy. The concept here, if you're at a 62.5 pay philosophy or the 75th percentile, uh, that's the transition there. Rather than looking at the 50th, we would look at the 75th and create it from there. And I think you go into a little bit further into that. God, it's like we work together. I don't. It's almost as if we've been here and doing this before. <laughs> <laughs> well. When Jeff talks about pay philosophy, so we do this market pricing exercise and look at the top. 56.205 was what we came up with at midpoint, right? Well, 62.5, if your pay philosophy is want to play a market premium, we have clients that say we want to be 5% above the market or 10% or they actually pick a percentile like they want to be the 75th percentile. Knowing that every percentile you take higher than midpoint is going to cost you a little bit more but there's ways to make sure we get dollars in the right hand. So just here's an example of this is if we would have put this 30% spread salary range together with 56,200 as our anchor, that's that left side of that bar there. That's what you saw on the other page. But what happens if we want to do the 62 percentile? We call that a premium pay philosophy. Nobody's forcing you to do that. You don't have to do that. But if you think you want to pay a little bit better the market to see if you get a a more decent set of... uh, um, a, a candidate pool, it becomes a 59.3 number mm-hmm. as a midpoint. And then we do the 30% spread, and now we have a max at 67.1, and we have a minimum at 51.6. So it's, you know, instead of making the spread bigger on the 50th percentile to get a higher max, what we said is we're just philosophically saying we want to use the 60. Um, uh, two five, and or you could use the seven. You can use whatever you want. Yeah, it's just a we use the sixty two point five as kind of that middle ground between a slightly above market and but slightly below that seventy fifth percentile. So that happy medium that comes at sixty two point five. And the communication piece of that is strong because it's say, look, we want to be better than market, and this is this is our strategy to do that. And a, a complete side note on this one, not to detract too far, this becomes very important when you do pay for performance. Absolutely, it, it, especially if you're paying a market premium, pay for performance. Uh, having that process in place becomes extremely important. Okay, so here's this next scenario that we wanted to play with is saying, okay, if we lag and do the traditional way, if 56.2 was our midpoint, we build a range, which you saw on the the, this, the, second, the, the slide before this. But what happens if we want to do a lead strategy? Okay, so let's say we're going to have 7% inflation for, for 23. So we're trying to predict where we're going to be 1124. Uh, and so our midpoint is going to be 60,150. Use that 30, 30% spread strategy again, and then you get a range between 52.3 and 68,000. Now, this is rounded, guys. I hope there's no calculators out there going up. <laughs> All the CFOs are still with the brother yeah, pressures going up. <laughs> John, I think you didn't round that right. And this is just, again, for you know examples, examples only. But then lead lag would be if, well, if we're at a 7%, predicted rate, then let's do three and a half. And that's where we'd get that that midpoint at 58.2. Okay, so that that's just a quick example of when, and why we want to start early this year on the budgeting, I should have said this up front, is let's play with some of these to see what makes sense and what we can afford mm-hmm. and what would be the best, you know, for how, how we're looking at the organization. But this is also kind of why, uh, you know, I get a call every other day saying, hey, Jeff, how much should we move our salary structure? How yep. much should yep. we move our ranges? And there's a lot of things that come into play here. One, we got we need to know where you're at now mm-hmm. in relation to the market. Um, you know, when you do a study through us, you you uh, I always kind of target about 105 to 110 percent competitive to market. So we have that little bit of lead. So that can really determine how much you need. So there's no one set number of saying, oh yeah, four percent, four percent is what you need, five yeah. percent is what you need, or two point two five percent is what you need. Yeah, I agree. So, you know, we're going to go to kind of our next topic here and look at, okay, if we're, if we're going to be egalitarian, when you say move your range as 3% and everybody comes along for the ride, you're not, you're not going to accomplish your ultimate goal, mm-hmm. which is to get the dollars in the right hands and to recognize their top performers. So, Jeff, walk us through this. And that, that actually brings up a great point. One, there's two different things that are happening here. Moving your salary structure, as you said before, doesn't get money in the hands immediately. So we have to talk about, okay, how do we leverage the budget that we have and use that more strategically? And John and I have been talking about this for quite some time, and that's really kind of defining that critical workforce. This is uh, you know, kind of arbit- uh, against what we've done in the past where we had this unnecessary need to be egalitarian. Everybody got their 3%. Everybody got their 4% or whatever the case may be or whatever the increase may be. Now, if we're dealing with, say, we have a 6% budget, that critical workforce needs to get 7 or 8 or 9% of that. You know, They yeah, have yeah. to have that biggest portion of that. 
So step one is we've got to clearly define what the cr- the critical workforce is. And that's that could that may not be executives. That may not be your top performers even. We have to strategically decide where are those critical linchpins in the organization that provide disproportionate value. You and know, if you're doing if you've got a strategic initiative in IT and you know you've got a one person with a talent to make to make that execution, I don't care what level their organization is. There's something that we we yeah. look to retain, right? Absolutely, and I mean, where you're defining the specialist as well. If you look at the towards the top there, I think John had a great example of that. That's like your data analyst. You know, they're very hard to find that skill set. They're highly specialized. Uh, replacing them is very difficult. But when it comes down to the impact of the value on the, the the organization, they take that information and then hand it to somebody that develops strategy from that. Yeah, that develops the process moving forward. That that's where your critical work forces at, being able to take that data and turn it in, again, in, into information. Now, this is grunt work when, mm-hmm. we, when we do this because it is person by person. It's not job by job, and it's not t- a level by level. So critical workforce, or what we define, is really high, highly skilled individuals, just disproportionate value. So, you know, on, on the chart here, high, high, you know, supply and demand is going to be a factor, but also impact or value, and that's why they're in the top white right quadrant. Not a title, but a person and a job. Yep. Then we got our specialist supply and demand issues that they may or not be high on the value chain just because their work is given to somebody senior, and then the senior person can execute and you know make magic happen. But we have to have that person is just you know the kind of the blocking and tackling. Now the core workforce. When we go back to egalitarianism, and by the way, I've said that four times, and you've said it too. <laughs> so let's. Uh, wait, wait. Matt, can we get, can we get a. a, a S- that bingo that square is full. So I, I'm, I'm out of those words. <laughs> but the critical workforce in the past, that would mean everybody's going to rise to the top, and we're saying mm-hmm. we need you because they're, you know, if they're, it's a member facing or something in the back, back office. That's that that's 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 key. That's core. Yep. But that's not everybody. You know, we want to we want to break it out to see if, if from a budgeting perspective how we can deliver the value. And then that flexible piece is when you part timers, contractors that you need them for a short amount of time. Um, uh, we, the supply and demand's tough, so that's why you go outside to maybe buy it for a you know for a, a period of time. So with this said, what's your priority? Who you, who who are we looking at first? Our critical workforce. And Simple it's that. person by person. So that's why we say, why do we start er- early? Because we want to look at you know, doing something to start to identify what that means in your organization. At the very core of this, at the, 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 to distill it down to the easiest concept here, it is uh, the difference between what is fair and what is equitable. Those that are providing disproportionate value, you need an yeah. equitable state in there. Yeah. And, and a cliche I always say is, I can tell you what a job's worth. I cannot tell you what a person's worth. Absolutely. I'm not there every day. I don't see them work. You're there. You, you, you have to make the call. And that's, I love that concept. You know, people have unlimited earning potential. They have unlimited capabilities. Jobs don't. Jobs I mean, there don't. is a certain level in which that job is limited out and you have to uh, factor in the cost of a replacement player. Yeah, and, you know, and that's why I think sometimes we'll get the call that says, can we move this max or can you reprice it? Yep, and, yep, yep. In the interview process, we're kind of, well, this, we're really doing this for a person, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, they're, they're maxed out or they can't move. And we say, jobs, unlimited uh, value, I mean, people, people unlimited value. Jobs do have a terminal piece. Um, so this is just a quick, you know, this we've shown this before, but just want to reinforce it, the idea of what a top performer is versus a critical workforce and some stats that have come out there. Um, top performers, 5 to 10%. Um, you know, just, I'm not going to read the list, but the idea is that Top performers, you have to be pragmatic, you have to be real, and that's why I want you to start budgeting earlier to start to see what that looks like in your organization. Yeah. And this is where your your performance management process comes into play, so you're recognizing your top performers. This is not saying that, you know, oh, the critical workforce is uh, all completely separate. A lot of these overlap. Your top performers are often ca- uh, case critical workforce. But you need to take care of both of these sides of things. So the pay for performance piece really takes care of the top performers, but where you're designating and designing those uh, uh, kind of focus points for the critical workforce, a little bit separate outside of that. And I've always said it's okay to have different pay strategies under your pay umbrella, mm-hmm. right? And so the idea is if you, uh, if you have a hot group, you know, supply and really good return, you can set them as a pay, f- pay f- uh, premium yep. relative to our core workforce. 
Um, I have no problem with us having a premium position for our C-suite and a a market competitive for our core workforce. Yep. Well, that, that we're treating them special. No, I'm looking at the return and the value delivered, and uh, you know the cost to replace and and the consequences of not keeping them retained, and it and it more than justifies itself. And a lot of times, uh, I'll get the concept of, okay, well, if we pay a premium for this, moving forward, we're going to have to continue to pay these premiums for the, Well, for that individual, and they were providing a disproportionate value, so you reward them for that. But if the market then changes and goes back down, you say, okay, you guys are staying where you're at, but when we hire on a new position, they're going to be at the 50th percentile or something yeah. along that line. So it comes back into alignment moving forward, and then you also don't have that situation where you're leapfrogging. You're hiring in over those individuals that have been there for a while and they suffer that loyalty penalty. Some strategies here to look at um, the critical workforce. Sometimes it, we could use a two-pool two pool increase. So we, we, we budget 5% for our top 20% of our workforce and 2.5% for our, the 80% of our workforce. And guess what we get back to? 3% overall. So you know whatever the number you know, you're looking that you can afford this year, make that, that differential. You know, can we get six, seven, or eight in the top 20 and then bring along our, you know, our, our, our core workforce at, at, at the same type of ratio? And I, I know this is kind of an older slide, but 3% ain't going to cut it. <laughs> no. Pl- yeah, please don't. Uh, <laughs> please don't say. <laughs> this isn't D- the recommendation slide. D- Hilton <laughs> said 3% budgets this year. And the next one is, and this one's difficult, is, you know, if somebody is – you know, just meeting expectations, you know, where do we, where do we draw the line before we give meaningful raises or we give more cost of living-esque raises or the consequences we're paying you fair? You know, to be tough, performance evaluation, performance management has to be very strong in those mm-hmm, situations, mm-hmm. but it's a way to look at it. And I love this strategy for the sense of it is very pro-member. You know, I want the best and brightest and the most motivated people in front of my members. I'm willing to recognize that. And just doing the job, you know, that's what you can get in any other financial institution. How do we differentiate this place? We differentiate it with our folks, and I want to recognize the people that get it. Yeah. And I think that's the difference of just framing it. It's not compensation. It is rewards and recognition. Yeah. You're rewarding and recognizing a disproportionate value to the organization. Yeah, and, and, and the, th- the third one here when we look at, you know, increased timings, you know, in the dictionary, it doesn't say annual merit increase. It says merit increase, and somebody attacked, attacked, uh, attacked on annual. I mean, it's a once a year thing. And the market, you know, for some of our younger folks and our high performers, that's not good enough. Mm-hmm. So to be tagged in the top twenty percent of the workforce and then be able to say we're going to look at you every six months, it might come out to the same number. It's just the 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 um, <coughs> excuse me the the frequency. Yeah, and the whole concept is that the time value of money for individuals. Right now, you're looking at bills that are coming in. They need that money in their pocket, so the yeah. time value of money has gone up a lot more. And that's not just you know in terms of investing and things along that nature. So, you know, the idea, and I know a lot of folks that we've, we've championed the idea in that first year of employment, maybe a, a bump. When they go through go through uh, you know the initial training, then a, a bump three months later to say hey you're getting it, and then then they go back to your regular cycle. But discretionary bonuses, retention bonuses, and lump sum merits are ways ways to address some of these issues that are coming up that we can get dollars into some of our high performers. Yeah, and I like the lump sum idea because uh, for those that are really hesitant about moving salaries up too much, this is kind of a one time fix that helps the situation. Uh, it's not quite a uh, Band-Aid on a bullet hole situation, yeah, yeah. but it's fixing things. So, you know, I think another thing our industry can do a better job of is a pay philosophy used to be a one-sentence thing, right? We will we, we pledge to pay at market and be, you know, for because we, you know, we care about our employees. There's a lot more levels, a lot more texture to that than just one sentence. So the idea of a pay philosophy, look at, look at this diagram that says, We've got to look at what does recognition play in our in our organization. What does our our short term incentives versus pay pay play in our play in our strategy? And then finally, what do we do for long term incentives? So when you answer this strategy, I think you've got a complex and meaningful pay philosophy. Not that we pay the market, or you know we're trying to you know pay a premium to market. What how, what do I do with that? So this this helps you helps you look at that. Now. 
inflation and perceived fairness, and it's this year it's it's really reared its ugly head. Perception: if people think it's not fair, it's not fair. There's no there's no there's no other way to look at that. So the idea is that how much do we want to communicate and share with folks about how we do things? I know 100% of our clients agonized to, to totally make sure that they're competitive out there. And, 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 but we've got to make sure that we're communicating because if you do that in a vacuum, it might as well not be fair. Okay. So I've got a good case study for you and I'm going to <laughs> talk about one of my daughters because she is just a wealth of information. So I'm driving to work three weeks ago and she calls me in the phone and goes, everything okay? Cause it was early in the morning. She goes, yeah, but uh, I just had my boss just had a talk to me about my compensation, and I wasn't happy with my merit increase. And I go, well, what did she say? And she said, well, you know, I know this raise is not that good, considering <laughs> great the boss had, had acknowledges that it wasn't good. <laughs> but she says, the good news is that you're at the very bottom of your salary range, so you have no <laughs> nowhere up to go. It's a few red flags and there. I go, I go, ouch! I could see how that 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 hurts your feelings. And then, so they kept talking, and then her, her, her boss had an epiphany and said, oh, and by the way, we just raised our salary ranges, so you have even more <laughs> room to grow. Strike two. So I said, said Catherine, go, go to your website and um, look, at, look at what they say about compensation. So they have an, an, you know, a kind of a... Uh, um, a an por- intranet. Uh, yeah, an intranet, a portal for their employees. And the questions, we have it up on the screen here. Um, these were these. Look at the questions they are ready to ask. You know, what what's your leader's role as a pay coach? What pay info should you share? Pay conversation tips. This is getting the boss ready for this conversation that didn't go well. And then you know, questions for difficult pay conversation. What happens if employees pays at max? What if they're at market? What are, what do we say about salary ranges? What if they think it's too high or too low? So I said, Catherine, when you get to work. Go look at that because those are really good things. And so this is what she got <laughs> when she clicked on one of those things. Go, oh, Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, you're not supposed to know about any of these things, are you? <laughs> and look, this is not a joke about the company and I'm not disparaging it. I'm just saying why frontline managers are so important in this. This is not an HR issue. And this was just a perfect example of, you know, I think my daughter, my daughter's pretty talented, and she's been with the company a long time. And I would think she would be better than a midpoint uh, employee f- for what she's done. But the way that was delivered, all all the goodwill was gone. And it was and nothing but bad news on just a constant barrage there. What wasn't the best one though? Uh, but good news, we raised <laughs> the ranges sorry, have gone. So you got so far, <laughs> so far to go. Look at how long of a trajectory yeah. your career has to get to market value. <laughs> Yikes! And that, that's the other big thing is that you know if people understand what the market value is, yeah. and you tell them that they're at the minimum of their range, what have you just told that person? Yeah. Yeah. You you're know, not, and even if they don't even understand where midpoint is, if they think midpoint is average, what have you just told that person? So, well, yeah, I, I. I w- 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 and you know, I love doing platform training. I actually would do a, a thing with frontline managers. I said, raise your hand if you're average. <laughs> if you're the definition, I've never had anybody ever raise a hand in the history of thirty something years of doing that that training. So saying nothing's not a, is not an option simply because people will go, you know, to d- deep depths depths <laughs> of what's really happening, and it's not always true. Yeah, and it, that's the big thing is that if you're not leading that conversation, the conversation is happening, and whether or not you're containing that narrative or filling the gaps of knowledge, um, yeah, it's probably time to start doing that. If so here's a framework, it. right? Mm-hmm. This charge says a framework, and it's it's not going to tell you. I, I have no absolute no recommendation for you where you should be relative to your culture. But, you know, if you only give people paychecks and they don't talk about it, guess what? You know, here's what you get paid. That's the communication strategy for your organization. If you, t- you tell them that you do market studies, you know what people think. Ooh, everybody's getting a big old Windfall. race. Windfall, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? But all you're saying is we're going to go gather some data. And if you share ranges, you're in the middle. And then you say, here, you know, here's why we pay. You know, we're a pay-for-performance organization, so your performance management has to reinforce that. Your incentive plans, your, you know, your spot bonuses. And then we, all, we get all the way down to open salaries, which is super scary to me. And you know, some of the high-tech and fintech world have, have tried that, and they, and they go, oops. Whoops, yeah. So um, I, heard a, this, I heard this last week. Um, it, it was a fintech company that sent out uh, kind of a, a, um, a 
pay statements on what you what are you really getting paid? You know, when we put all the benefits together, which is a great idea. We love that idea. Except they gave somehow the the programming was off, so everybody got somebody else's statement. <laughs> so if you have eight tellers and you get the wrong thing, and you find out that Jeff makes what, and you're John, and you go. Wow. And, you know, you might be sit, sitting at another table at lunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> the other interesting thing of this, you know, when we talk about the open salary piece of that, is that, yeah, you know, everybody has the hesitation on what level of transparency they're willing to do. But I look at, uh, you know, a buddy of mine that works at Blizzard over in California, and apparently there was just this big upheaval or, of, you know, what people are getting paid. They actually had everybody submit their salary, and they kept a spreadsheet of everybody's yeah. salary for positions for salary, and they posted this. Mm -hmm. They decided we're going to have this conversation because we're not getting enough information about how our pay is decided, what we're being paid, why we're being paid that way. So you know what? We don't think it's fair. The perception was no fairness. Yeah. What are they going to do about it? They're going to talk about well, it. Well, the employees took the narrative away. Yeah, right? exactly. So, again, so on our on our value chain, the less you talk about it, so people are are, are are doing that. I've seen that in the Northwest, a ton of it. Yep. So let's talk about base pay transparency. Um, if, we're, if we need more talking points to make it more personal. So it's not about what Jeff makes. John, if you're motivated by money, what can we do? To get you to your goal, if you want to aspire to be a higher level, what can we do? So you got to have those talks. Um, having some type of, uh, you know, a, a, a fact sheet to let people know, as a as a manager, frontline manager, uh, to what they can say. So in in my daughter's example, they nailed the questions. I just don't know how the delivery, <laughs> the training <laughs> wasn't yeah. very important on that. Piece. And I think um, <laughs> setting expectation with new hires is really important today. You know, having those, you know, mini bumps through that first year to get it, get them going. And then every frontline manager needs to know about compensation. I don't care if they're front office, back office, benchmarking, comp 101 has got to be in their wheelhouse. Yep. Of and expertise. It, and the funny thing is, is that so many managers and I, I, are so uncomfortable about having compensation conversations. But then when they look for those sources yeah. or be able to have those conversations, yeah. we get this very high level, high fluent kind of thing and they don't really dig into it. So giving them that training, giving them the capabilities to have those conversations, make them comfortable with it, or at least give them the tools to be somewhat comfortable. Right. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And then other questions that we need to be pre prepared to talk about is if you have some type of competency model that people test into a higher, a, you know, a proficiency test that they, they, they test into higher levels of competition, are we communicating, you know, how that happens? And to me, my biggest gripe is just because you're great at test taking and, you know, how did you deliver? Mm -hmm. So there's got to be both. It's like you, you're, you aspire to the competency, you prove the competency by delivering results. Just take, taking the test does, doesn't help it for the membership. And that's always been my um, concern with broadbanding. You know, if you're a super achiever and a great test taker, you're going to be at the top of your thing. Did you make any more loans? Well, not necessarily. And you go through this list. What are the critical skills and roles that, may, that are compensable in a credit union? And how do we put those into our uh, reward and recognition program? What do we pay premiums for? You know, if you're really turned on by, by money, what can you do for our organization where it's, you know, supply and demand issue or we're short and we need more bench strength? Can we direct people that way because we're going to recognize that? And then, you know, I think you always have to look as if you publish, you know, do you publish your salary ranges or not? I think one of the cardinal sins we all make is when a great back office person becomes a mediocre front office person because they perceive they're the golden children because they don't know what the ranges are. So I have no problem publishing ranges and letting people um, aspire to that. But with good coaching, say, Jeff, you are a tremendous person. You are a tremendous accountant. You don't like people that much. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> so even though the, Wait a you, <laughs> you, you want to go to this job because it's going to make you know, you know five dollars more an hour, you're going to be miserable. Mm -hmm. Let me show you how you can make five dollars an hour more with what you're good at. And you know the best thing we can do is to have that type of communication. And and you know we need to do a poll on that. Is you know our HR folks and our CEOs, C suites, are we okay with publishing or not publishing? You know, there's not right, right or wrong. It, it, it's cultural, right? Yeah. What do you want to do? But I guarantee you, people, more people will make more mistakes with lack of information. Uh, it, up to and including what? 
leaving the organization. Absolutely. And the biggest thing is, is when you don't have all the information, you are going to fill the gaps in. With, you know, that's how the rumor mill works. Absolutely. And it's always the worst case scenario. There's nobody oh, yeah. that's just like, oh, it's just sunshine and rainbows. Don't worry about it. We're fine. You know, the longer it goes on, the more negative it becomes. Yeah. So having that conversation, talking about those, getting managers and supervisors the capability of being able to have those conversations, extremely vital. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Excellent. So again, here's just a kind of a, a value chain of how we would look at it. How do you discover where what's out there? What's our strategy to to communicate it to staff? To, to staff, and then what's our game plan to monitor and and keep that program going? So this will be a good slide. I almost call this a diagnostic slide where you know you look at your own program, where you're strong, where you're weak, or where are some of the things that maybe you should add to the program. Starting today, you can't do this like a budget starts August 1st and August 15th, you're supposed to have your numbers in. You need to start some of this today. And I said it a few times today, but I just wanted to reinforce the, this idea of pay, pay transparency, salary administration is not HR's problem. You administer a program. It is a business issue. It's a frontline manager issue. It's a CEO, CEO issue. It's a board issue. And until we re realize that it is a key component of our strategy plan, it's not going to get its due. Yep. And if it's on a slide by itself, John definitely thinks this is very important. <laughs> yeah. It's its own title card there. <laughs> is, is that what I do? Yeah. <laughs> when it's a point you want to drive home, it is one slide and one thing. That's it. <laughs> okay. It's like if it was a chalkboard, I'd be doing... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Underline, underline, an exclamation okay. point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, if the people that know me know I'm left-handed, and third grade Mrs. Walker was my teacher, and she wouldn't teach me cursive because I was left-handed. You know, I didn't know that. I'm left-handed. She goes like this. Yeah. She goes, class, can I have your attention? <laughs> this is how John Andrews write. If you don't practice, you're going to end up like him. <laughs> So, uh, that's, so that's that's why I still print. I see, I see. It all makes sense now. Okay, just to, just to let you know that. So, um, the communication. Look, we know three out of four leaders don't think they're confident that managers have the ability to have these conversations. You mentioned it a little earlier. So I guess, so how do we start, you know, when I say benchmarking comp 101, I really think HR needs to take the lead and get a hold of our frontline managers and say, this is how to be a boss. But one of those competencies or, or modules has to be, how do you, how do you do reward recognition and, and pay for performance? So when we look at this, uh, what we do with the do list here, we communicate the value of the employee. And you said it earlier, you have unlimited potential, you know, jobs, you know, are, there are there are caps to that, but that doesn't that's not going to stop you if we have a good relationship. Um, you know, decisions were how we want to be fair, in, and you need to re rehearse and practice that because if you're going to be spontaneous, there's a good chance that it's not going to come out right. Don't wait to year end. Don't don't wait till they're moping around. Don't forget that you're paid for performance. And I think one of the strongest things to do is like, you know, even though we're not supposed to talk about that, you know, so and so they said they got a six percent raise and I only got a four percent raise. You know, but we we're doing the same thing, and we can go, Jeff. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about you know Sally, but you know, do you know you how you always seem to get sick. Uh, the Friday before a three day weekend and make it a four day weekend. Do you know like when it's four fifty eight, I can't find you, but you know, Sally's still answering, phone's still five fifteen. I'm not talking about her, but if you aspire to six percent, these are the behaviors, the 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 the, the, the performance we need to see. Because I love it when somebody comes to me and say they're not happy. Because it gives me the opportunity as, oh, now I have your attention. Let me tell you what you can do for that. Yep. Okay, And as we're seeing in the world right now, the grass is not greener, and I think that's going to change where people are just going to leave for a dollar more an hour and because we're seeing some of those opportunities drying up in the next you know, 12 to 18 months. But another piece to that puzzle there is, again, I'm going to go back to the performance management piece of this, is that if you have a performance review with somebody and they're surprised by yeah, you know, why yeah, they got oh, that, yeah. we've gone too long between having those performance reviews. And I always love it, like, it's almost like the crocodile tears. And, oh, I thought I was going to get a better score than that. I just, you know, I try so hard. And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Today is uh, one of those conversations. Yes. <laughs> Things Jeff could do better. Volume one. <laughs> no, we just had that yesterday, right? <laughs> <laughs> volume two. Volume three. <laughs> yeah. Tune in next week, Jeff. Can't wait. Can't wait. But again, our goal here on, the, on, the, on that last bullet, it's neutral at best. Not high, not low. Let's just be professional about it and, and kind of set the stage for that.
Yeah. And uh, the big thing is, is that if you do have good news, make sure you're delivering it in a way that is good news. I remember we had just recently somebody that was getting a raise, getting all this other stuff, but the manager framed it as just, well, it's not as much as you would think. It's not as much as we, where do you want to be? Well, we can't get you there. It was just framed so poorly from the get go. Yeah. And again, you know, one of the things that's coming out of these first modules today is simply a, let's train that frontline manager to be part of us, not them. Yep. You know, and they've got to do that. So our final section here, and we're doing good on time, So, but I, we understand if you have to leave, we'll, we'll have this all uh, uh, packaged for you next week. And, and the slides will be available. You'll Absolutely. have a follow-up uh, email after the presentation that does have a link to download the slide deck. Right, and I'm, it's going to be – I think it's good stuff. Um, you know, my thought and concept when Jeff and I put this together was simply as we want you to play with some scenarios in the next couple of months to see what's going to work best for you. And so the, the next module is just some simple ways that we're looking at the same issues and how do you at- attack them. So we've said this before, the difference between if you get a 3.0 on your meriting, uh, your performance evaluation versus 3.5 for a $20 hour employee is $208. So I don't care how fancy you're going to make that or spend that, Jeff. You know, you're an asset to the credit and you're awesome. And here's – and that equals like a, a dime a dime an hour or something. <laughs> so, you know, with that said, this is what the perception that we're going to go after. So let's give you some examples here. So core uh, personal consumption expenditure, which is like inflation without gas and food and, you know – how can we even talk about that when every person going to work is paying more for, for gas and, and bread costs more? And that's why last our last webinar we talked about the gas gift card and re, re, attacking some of that was a good way to look at that. But when we look at core stuff, 22, we're going to be in, you know, let's call it low fours, and 23, it'll calm down. And then 24, you know, if we go this cycles predicted correctly, we're kind of back to where we are. But again, this is all awesome for budgeting, but this is your frontline teller, single mom with three kids. They could care less about any of these numbers. So we have to be more, much more actionable and responsive to our employees in, in, in these areas. You know, it just you know, it's Bloomberg, it's it's uh, Wall Street Journal. Oh, if you take out inf- if you take out gas, we're doing pretty well. <laughs> well, you take out gas. <laughs> yeah, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> So here's an example of what we're talking about. So if you have a five point, you know, and this is how we budget a, a workforce and, and an, an annual number that we'll need for 23. So on, on the right, the, the little table says, okay, four, six to five exemplary down to effective development stage is something that we love to, to, to champion in our systems and not present. You're not below average because if you tell somebody one to five is the score, and three is the midpoint, and if you're a 2.8, you're crestfallen, like, oh, I'm below average. And what we're saying, your development stage, you know? I'm expecting you to do the same thing that a 10-year experienced vet is doing as an MSR because our members expect you to do that. You're on your way, but not today if you're going to be fair about it. So that's why we break it up this way. So, you know, if, if we look at at least a 5% being a baseline, that, that gets into that number – with that, that core inflation number for next year. So being being able to look at 5 to 8% for our superstars is great. Now, 2.5 versus 2.4. 2.4 is where we suggest you draw a line that would say, you know, you're going to keep working on it, but not today. So yeah. whether you postpone it three months or six months and look at it again, or you say you have to wait a year, that's up to you and your culture. But we wanted to show you an example of don't think that we have to give everybody something just because inflation is up. It should be a win-win street or, or joint accountability is the best way to say it. Okay, so we go 5% core and then here's what 6% looks like. So to communicate that raises are between 6 and 9% is very strong. And then if somebody gets a 5%, we have a discussion. You're in development stage. You're going to be there. We're looking at it. And then here's this table at 7% where you can say what raises are 7 to 10%. But again, if you manage it through critical workforce, 20% you know, versus 80%, you're going to get to a number that's going to be reasonable for the budget, but getting hands and 
dollars in the, in the in the proper hands. Yeah, and, and much like the uh, CFO's blood pressure going up, I can feel everybody in HR's blood pressure going up because they always yeah. have managers that are you know everybody's a five. So this is again extremely important. The top down kind of methodology. It has to be a performance management process needs to be implemented, and it needs to be structured very well, and it needs to be reinforced through the entire organization. And the executive team really needs to push on that. And, and the two points there, Jeff, is, you know, when I do training, I say, we appraise the appraisers on how well they appraise. Mm-hmm. So if they're giving everybody fives because they don't want to deal with conflict or they're all their buddies and they're now they're managing their buddies, the only person they're going to hurt is them. Yep. Because I'm counting on them to be my, you know, my boots on the ground or, you know, ears, eyes and ears to know how well this workforce is doing. And if everybody gets the same score, I just don't believe that. And right. we're we're really hurting those that are providing that disproportionate value. I understand that, you know, you have somebody on the team that might be struggling and we want to be fair and we know that they need that money and so on and so forth, but you're taking that money away from those that are really making the business better, making your life better as the manager. Uh, if you had more of them, what could you accomplish? Yeah, that's, and again, that's the cardinal sin is, you think you're being fair by propping them up. Well, you know, they're having trouble with their kid or, you know, they're, they're, they're in a rough spot. I don't want to kick them while they're down. So you artificially raise that person's score. But what happens is the worker that did all the work and the extra work to make up that person's deficit in your department, and we give them the same score, you just, you just kick them in the gut. Yep. And again, it comes down to being comfortable having tough conversations about that as well as establishing what do we do now? How do we move yeah. forward? How do we get you to where you want to be or need to be? So whether we you look at next year, you look at that five to eight, you know, six to nine, or that seven to ten. The, the key principles are: be willing not to give raises to underperformers. Be willing to look at development as a concept and look at multiple hits to they achieve a certain level. Because, you know, we do all this for the members. Is it good for the members if we have everybody that's a, you know, performing above above expectation? Yeah if and only if they're performing there. And I I love that. David really put that well. It's best for the member if dot, dot, dot. David Hilton, our boss, is tremendous. You know, that statement sticks with me all the time, and it really really just focuses the question. Is it good if we do it or not? So this is something we used to do, and a lot. And then because inflation got hot, we kind of went away from it. But the concept is still pretty valuable. So... Sometimes instead of having a one matrix, we have two matrix matrices. And one is um, for folks below midpoint and one above midpoint. So when you're below midpoint, when it comes time for your performance management review, I want to pay you for two things. I want to pay you for skill acquisition and performance. So you see in this example, um, six to nine versus the above midpoints, five to eight. So what I like to communicate to that employee was, I pay you a premium every day if you're above midpoint to market because you've earned it, you deliver, and I expect you to continue to deliver excellence. You don't have to prove it to me. So your raise is based on the performance piece of it because I'm prepaying for those other folks. Mm -hmm. Some people hate this idea. They say, well, they got got 8.4, I got 7.4. That's not fire. So I want to use it as a a vehicle or forum to talk about – why we have p- people paid differently, why we might bring somebody from the outside in that's going to be above you because, look, they have six years of experience. You have two years of experience, but we're not talking about that. You want to make this? This is your roadmap to get there. Okay, so I just want you to have any any tool that you can have to recognize those folks and to get money in the right hands. And you're not necessarily fond of this, right? No, I think in the, especially in the times that we're at right now, uh, when you have these top performers that are exceeding expectations on the consistency, when they're above midpoint, yeah, you're paying them above market. If they continue to absolutely crush it and we start slowing them down, yeah, yeah that 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 we throttle know, down. We have to really, really balance the message here that what we're saying and how we utilize this. To me, this is once uh, inflation kind of settles back down, everything starts settling it back in. That's where I think that this starts really becoming much more important again. But for now, I don't want to lose my top performers. I want to yeah. push into them as much as possible. See, see, that's a good point. And, and I think that's why our discussion earlier about critical workforce. Mm-hmm. Just because you're above midpoint doesn't mean you're going to be critical workforce. That's true. You know, because that can be tenure-based, longevity, 
city, you've outlasted us all. So, you know, when we had systems that were pretty stable, this this reinforced that you got to perform, not just, you know, show up. Absolutely. Okay? So this just another option, if, if that works for you, great. But I think the critical workforce in the next two to three years is going to be more of your friend. Yeah, because it, it doesn't matter if you've been here for six years if you're still not good at what you do. <laughs> it's, uh, like me, you know, that's it. That's uh, that's where I'm at. That's my story. <laughs> and that's that's what I meant by volume two. Things, <laughs> things Jeff could do better. I'm allergic to self-promotion. <laughs> that's it. <a, laughs> <laughs> That's so true. So, uh, you know, our last slide is, okay, this is a preliminary, guys. We're going to be monitoring this week by week by week. But you've seen us do this in the past. We always look at budgets and we look at capital positions. So, under, you know, if you look at Q&A and Q, sometimes they'll give you an, an overall number. And an overall number includes high-performing credit unions and credit unions that have issues that need to take care of. If you have capital concerns, you're under 7%. You might not have the luxury of doing some of the things that we're talking about here, right? You better be looking at critical workforce to get, you know, what the limited budget or resources in the right hands. So this is what we're thinking. So for staff, we're looking at zero to four. For exec, zero to six. When we look at seven to ten percent capitalized credit, four to five, eight to nine and a half, and then for wells. Uh, well capitalized, we're looking at five to seven and nine to ten. It's a, ten, a two digit number I haven't seen since um, I want to say late nineties. Mm. Yeah, and, and congratulations, you just gave every CFO a heart attack. No, 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 because we're going to do critical workforce. <laughs> we're going to manage that budget, and but strategically, we need, but we need to get some dollars in the right hands. Absolutely. Um, now. With this happening, what we're monitoring too, and, and we and we're not making light of those job cuts that we talked we started with today because that's traumatic. There's a lot of families that are impacted by this, but those folks that left your organization because the grass was going to be greener and all of those newfangled technologies were just going to be that pot of gold. I've seen that. I saw that in the '90s, and I saw that the early you know 2000s, and um, some of them work, but some of them don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like the lottery. You know, that one person that gets it, there's the 100 million that play that, that, that don't win. So start with these numbers. And again, Jeff, we're not, not to freak people out, but it's going to have to be more than that 3% number that you've done for the last five years. If you look at critical workforce, if you look at, you know, look at, look at how, where to spend the money and how to deliver it to get the best impact, I think it's, it's going to help. Um, we're going to monitor this month by month. We'll probably redo this webinar in September. I know that's late for some people on budget, but just yeah. just trying to gather data to see 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 what we can. Something do. tells me we'll be touching in on this yeah. pretty rapidly. But I mean, it, to your point in the last webinar that we had when we talked about what we're doing with this and how the uh, budgets have really kind of stayed in step with inflation. Yeah. If we take that into consideration now, this is not surprising. No, if we I mean, stay to, uh, true to our methodology previously, where it was, we wanted the cost of bread to be the same as the cost of bread next year is the same as the cost of bread next yeah. year. So we had to follow that inflation. This is not too surprising. Yeah, but we got we, we got to we got to get off the bread and we got to get to the gas tank. Yeah, exactly. This year, which is which which is an ouch, big ouch out there. All right, so uh, we got a little bit of time for some questions. So yeah. if you guys uh, hang with us here, we'll kind of try to get through a couple of these. Um, how do you address the broad salary ranges in an organization, what employees see, and the market data, specific positions for the roles uh, at the 50th or 62.5 uh, percentile? Employees focus quite a bit on the general salary ranges. Yeah, and you know, for the states that are required now to post ranges, the company strategies are to give you the most ridiculously wide ranges that aren't, you know, you know, it's standard deviations from a normal range and they quote the standard div, you know, high and low. And then people automatically go do what? They go to the top. Yeah. So the more you can communicate that you've got a real number in a real market, I think your employees can, can see that. But that's, that's to me just an extension of, oh, I have a buddy that makes $200,000 or I saw $200,000 on the, on the internet and we go, okay, you know, let's look at the source, what it is and what they had to do to get it. MLOs are definitely uh, uh, very guilty of that. Oh, you can earn from 50000 to 800000 <laughs> well, yeah. What do they see? Well, 800000 well, It's commercial lending. Yep. It's, it's um, you know, indirect lending. It's, you know, not just, just not, not just mortgage business even. 
Uh, is a 30% spread from min to max the recommendation or what are the factors you should consider when determining the spread? My experience has been 40% spreads. Maybe that's outdated. No, 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 no. Yeah. That, that was one of the things I was always concerned with when we show these de- uh, representations. This was just a demonstration of where the salary range is at. Uh, 30% is, it really depends on the situation. Front of the house, that's possible, uh, but that's a very tight range. 30% spread is very small. But here, here, here's my thinking on that, and I advocate a lot more 30s than I used to. Is 40, you're correct. 40% was the classic staff, and 50% was the classic spread for uh, uh, manage, senior managers and managers. The reason I like to use 30 in today's market is I want that minimum to be closer to the the midpoint. Remember how we talked about earlier, the wider the range, the the further. The lower down, yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm trying to get – I want those people up to speed. So the old days we say it it should take you five years to be total skill acquisition midpoint. And you're a teller, and I'm going to wait five years for you to learn (laughs) I believe you've been (laughs) everything. I would love to be the member in your line. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. By year five, I'm going to get the hang of this. So yeah. so two things have to happen. I'm okay with 30%. I'm okay with 20%, believe mm-hmm. it or not. But it has to be in conjunction with a pretty strong pay for performance concept. So my, it's not longitude tenure perceived a success. It's performance based on the criteria we set, whether it's sales or service or, yep. or competency. And so this works great at the front of the house. So, to your point, you know, we are targeting the market rate for these positions. We're not going to do 30% above market rate for a teller in many cases. No, but, so having but that pay, big range is... Yeah. But pay for performance, you'd say, yeah, absolutely, I'll pay that person that. And we'll just continue going through it. Absolutely. So, but thanks for the question, because I think, let's reinforce this idea is the tighter the spread, the, the starting salary is the closest to midpoint. If and only if we have good pay for performance to let 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 the natural uh, uh, performance, you know, dis- distribute the rewards properly. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about salary ranges is that they are a guide. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. biggest thing that's tied to the market is that midpoint. The other pieces of that are kind of your pay philosophy and how it all fits together. Uh, compensation philosophy drives those, not quite the market, so to speak. Um, how do you handle uh, hiring staff to make more than the current staff, especially for budget? Well, you have to quit and get rehired to get a raise. <laughs> that, that's what I'm doing. That's it. I'm out. I'm quitting and getting rehired. <laughs> yeah. um, that's what's so important about this idea of why we've always used lag strategies to build the salary ranges. If we did lead lag or lead, we'd have less of those issues. And the idea is that, again, pay for performance. If the person is strong, they're not going to have to worry about who's coming in being leapfrogged. But you can't take the just hardcore position of here's the rate and that's what I'm going to pay. And then, oop, I'm moving the new hires ranges, but I'm not. I'm going to keep moving you at 3% for merit increases. That's where you're going to run into trouble. Mm-hmm. It's been a problem since the dawn of time, but the more pay for performance you have in it, the less you have it for our top performers. Yep. And you know what? I don't, cr- I don't mind creating a little dissonance for an employee that's not performing. You know, if we just arbitrarily then move them higher, or they come along for the ride, well, you know, the new person's making 18, so everybody's got to make 18. Well, what about our non performer? They get it too? No. Yep. You know, you're. You're addressing the wrong issue. Yep. Uh, tra- uh, pay transparency definitely had a lot of questions on this. When talking yeah. about salary ranges being posted publicly, what do you recommend in that area? Um, it, when it comes down to those, I think the way the world is slowly moving towards pay transparency and salary ranges being posted, there's already multiple states that require that when you post a position that it has to have that range posted as well. Now, what are some of the pros and cons of that? Yeah, I think you need to act like – you need to – Act and deliver pay as if it is transparent and your degree when we have the chart that shows you what we're comfortable providing. But I guarantee you we can poke holes in a lot of the media that's out there, whether it's a salary range posted or when Bank of America says now they're you know, it's gonna be up tw- to twenty five. Well, twenty five dollars is our new thing. And they don't say that ten percent of their workforce is not gonna be there to enjoy that twenty five. Yep. So be real careful with the optics. Stay on top of it. Every time you get that, make sure you're having a response. Make sure you get that to your frontline manager so they can talk about it. But um, it's just not as clean and simple and, and wonderful as, as it sometimes that headline reads. I'm okay with transparency. A-OK. But I want to have a performance piece. Yeah. You can uh, understand why. You know, yeah. Again, that kind of goes to the transparency piece, understanding the why. The, the strongest pay philosophies that I like to write are, Jeff, you can be the best paid – person in your profession in this community in those periods and only in those peri- periods where you're the top performer. Mm-hmm. I'm really, as a, a small business, I'll write that check every day. 
right? That if you slide, there's got to be a consequence. Yeah. Pro and a con on that one. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I, again, I just think a lot of companies are messing with the, the publicly um, posted range. I think they're being over. over it's a marketing zip. campaign. Yeah, it, it comes is. down to it. Uh, probably last one we'll be able to get to because we've definitely gone over on this one. But uh, when we talk about salary ranges, if we're moving these salary ranges quite a lot, what happens to those salary ranges after inflation cools off? What do we do? Yeah. Well, remember, this is a year every year decision. So that's what bugged me about five years of 3% because to the employees, the perception was that was just autopilot, right? Yeah. So we want to communicate the ideas that you said about the price of bread, price of gas or whatever. We want to look at the market and make sure that we're competitive. So that's an annual discussion. And again, there'll be enough information in the press, in the media, and your employees will have it about when things cool off. And the, okay. the good thing about salary ranges is that you, when you get to the point where inflation slows down, uh, when the market starts coming back to a different area, you don't have to move the ranges as much. You know, like when we do our salary administration review, we do a regression analysis and say the market value for these roles lands within these range. Your salary structures are okay. You're in good shape. Mm-hmm. You don't have to move them five, six, seven yeah. percent. Maybe just one or two percent is okay for this cycle. Because what you have. The other piece, you have the performance management, the, the the merit increase matrix. You have pay for performance. You've got these tools, yep. and they all got to be working, and they all have to be commun- communicated. So, just because inflation cools off and we get back in 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 two years back to a normal, what you might perceive as a merit increase range. We've got these other things that are still going to have upside for employees. Yep. So the salary structure and the salary ranges don't have to move, but the pay, the actual pay, <laughs> yeah. that's still moving forward and that's moving in the right direction. And the market then catches up to those ranges as it yeah. slides underneath and the, the market value gets associated with it. We've got the moving parts. you got to be on top of the moving parts, and it's something we do. And again, when inflation was under 3%, some of our work was every two years or every three years, you know, to go back to the market. And I just can't see that for the next two years to be going to be as competitive as it should be. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, that's all the time we have for these. Let's, let's, um, one, one plug for the, Oh, uh, one plug. Let's, uh, there we go. It's, it's, it's your turn. Oh, no, 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 please. You do it so well. I really want to hear, because it's your birthday. I wouldn't yes. want to take this away from you. Come, come to the second annual John Andrews Birthday Bash in Houston. <laughs> it's very fun. Um, but we're having our symposium uh, November 10th and 11th. And for the folks that have been there, you know, it's where we, it's where we introduce our, our original research and, and debut that for the industry. We're working hard right now and, and a lot of moving parts to get you what you need to, to look at, at 2023. So today you got a taste of the things that we want to be looking at, and we just want to confirm that uh, we have spots. It's, it's, it's been very popular, and people are enrolling early. So if you want to come, and again, there's programs designed for HR practitioners. There's folk, there are programs for uh, a C-suite, and there's one for a, a program specifically for volunteers. So everybody will have a good learning session and a lot of camaraderie and you know our clients are so special they share and they give and they network and so you know it's not just me and Jeff and David and Debbie and Brian you know talking at you you'll get a lot out of it so we encourage you to come Please join us. Well, thank you so much for joining us for the webinar. We hope you were able to pull out some great information from that. Uh, Again, this webinar has been recorded, so you'll get a posting of this one on our website in about three to five business days. Uh, You'll also receive a follow-up email that will contain a download link for the slide deck. And please do go ahead and fill out that survey. If you got a couple moments, let us know how we're doing, how you liked it or disliked it. We'd love some good feedback. So with that, thank you so much. Please stay safe. We look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks a lot. All the best, guys. Stay safe. Bye-bye.